um, the first two we're going to solve by graphing. Graphing is, especially if you're not using graphing utility, if your graph is off a little bit, then you're going to find the wrong values. So for graphing, we would use Desmos. That means that if I do put one of these on the test where you have to do it by graphing, it wouldn't be by hand. So this would not be on the exam. It would be on the um, take home portion, not the in class portion. Bring Desmos up. So you go to desmos.com, click on graphing calculator. Here's our graphing calculator. So we can So if we look at the first one, A, you just want to type the equation 3 equals y equals 3x minus 12. So it graphs it. Then the second one, y equals 4x plus 2. Now we're going to have to, looks like they'll intersect down here somewhere. So we can zoom out. until we find it. Unlike when we're plugging in points, we can make a window, but we didn't have any points, so you could just zoom out until you find it. Then when you click on it, it will give you it. So the solution would be negative 14, negative 54. So you put in both equations, then you just click on the lines and it'll show you where the point is. It also shows you um, the y-intercept and the x-intercept. And if I hit the red one, show the x-intercept and the y-intercept. Any questions on that? We're going to do this next one. But Notice it's in, intersecting at one spot, so there's one solution. We do part B, y equals 2x plus 7. y equals 2x minus 5. Notice the two lines are parallel. They'll never intersect, so there's no solution. Any questions on that? So if they intersect in one spot, that's your solution. If they're parallel, there's no solution. Now, another thing that can happen, we'll leave the top one. We make the bottom one uh, 2y equals 4x plus 14. Notice they land on the same line. When that happens, then there's infinitely many solutions. So you could have one solution, no solution if they're parallel, and if they end up being the same line, there's infinitely many solutions. Any questions on that? Is everyone okay with the graphing? So that's how you solve by graphing. Questions?
We can also graph by what's called substitution. For the first one here, we have x equals 5y plus 12 and 3x plus 4y equals a negative 2. When it's solved for one variable, this is a nice time to do substitution because we can plug the 5x plus 12 into the 2x plus 12 because that's what x equals. So we take 3 times and then we put the 5x plus 12 sorry, 5y plus 12, plug this in here. Plus 4y equals a negative 2. So you're substituting one equation into the other. The salt, distribute 15y equal 15y plus 36 plus 4y equals a negative 2. Combine like terms, 15 and 4 is 19y plus the 36 equals a negative 2. Subtract the 36. get a negative 38 and divide by 19. Any questions so far? Um, we only found y, we need to find x. You can plug it into either one of the two equations. Of course, if we use the first one, it's simpler because it's already solved for x. So we can go x equals 5 times a negative 2 plus x equals 5 times negative 2 is a negative 10 plus 12 x is 2. So we have two, negative two as our solution. <clears throat> Any questions on that? And let's look at the next one, two x plus five y equals six. And x plus 2.5y equals 3. Now, if we're going to solve by substitution, neither one is solved for a variable. So we need to solve for a variable first. So it's this one right here. Now, notice in the first, if we solved for x, we'd have to divide by 2. We solve for y, we have to divide by 5. But on the second one, we could just subtract the 2.5y over, and then we have x equals. So if you have to use substitution, I would subtract this over, and you have x equals a negative 2.5y plus 3. So you have to have one solved for a variable, so then you could substitute it into the other. Any questions so far? So we're going to substitute this in for x. And we need to distribute so that we can solve 2.5. Negative 5y plus 6 plus 5y equals 6. 
Any questions so far? What's happening? Notice the Y's are dropping out. So we have six equals six. Because this is a true statement, there's infinitely many solutions. They are the same line. Notice if we multiply this by two, we have this one. So these two equations are the exact same line. If we graph them on Desmos, they'd land on top of each other. So there's infinitely many solutions. If this was not equal, then there'd be no solution. They'd be parallel. So if your variables drop out and it's a true statement, infinitely many solutions. If it's not a true statement, no solution. And I'm sure probably um, one of the next two will be that example. Any questions on that? Number three, solve by elimination. And when you're solving by elimination, you want to be able to add down and one of the variables are eliminated. In order to do that, um, right here, notice these canceled because we had a, po a positive 5y and a negative 5y. So you need the two variables, one to be positive, one to be negative, and be the same number. Well, this is already a two. If I multiply this by a negative two, these would drop out. What you're looking at is what number they both go into. For instance, if we wanted y to drop out, both of these go into a 12. That's the smallest number three and four go into. And so we'd want to make both of them a 12 by multiplying the top by 4 and the bottom by 3. Because then we'd get 12 and 12. Then we'd have to make one of them negative. So look at both of them and see what's going to be easier. This one we'd need to get 12s, which means we're going to have high numbers. This one, because this is a 1, both of these will go into 2. And this one's already 2. So we could just multiply the top one by a negative two. That way we have a negative two X and a positive two X. Is there any questions on that or why I chose it? I could have used four and negative three and then the Y's would have dropped out. Any questions? We're going to multiply now. Remember, this is an equation, so you have to multiply everything by that negative 2. We have negative 2x minus 6y equal to a negative 10. So I multiplied each term in the equation by a negative 2. Bottom one, I'm going to keep the same. Notice if we add down, we eliminate the X's. Any questions on that? So our X's drop out. Negative 6Y and 4Y is a negative 2Y equal to a negative 2. Getting Y by itself, we divide by the negative 2 y equals positive.
then you take this and plug it into either one of the equations and solve for x. I'm going to use the first equation, x plus 3y equals 5. Plug my 1 in. x plus 3 equals 5. Subtract the 3. x equals 2. So my answer is 2, 1. So if we graphed these two lines, they would intersect at the point 2, 1. Any questions on that? To another one. Okay, if we look at this one, well, right off the bat, I can see these. If I multiply this by a 2, well, actually negative 2 because you want opposite signs, this will drop out. These numbers are larger and it has a decimal. I'm going to stick with the integers. Um, so I would multiply on this one, the d bottom frac equation, a negative 2. Because then I would have negative 6x and my x's would drop out. Any questions on that? And all these story problems will be using the same processes. So you're not multiplying by like the least common denominator? Um, no. You're going to use the smallest common denominator, but that's what you want to make both of them as. Unlike when you have the fractions, you multiply by the common denominator to get rid of them. Um, here, we, we're using that process to eliminate the x's or the y's. So you're making both of them that same value. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we're not touching the top. The bottom will multiply by negative 2, so we get a negative 6x plus 9y equals positive 12. Unfortunately, on this one, notice your x's and your y's drop out. So on the left side, we have 0 equal to 24. This is the other case I talked about. When it's not equal to each other, this would be no solution. Any questions on that? Questions? The terminology we use for a business, and we talked about it um, sometime this week, break even, because we were talking about um, your profit would not be at a loss. Well, that's your break even. Break even is where a company is no longer at a loss. So if you're looking where you're not at a loss, you're looking for your break even point where they start making money. After where they start making money after that number. So you're finding the quantity 
um, that you need to produce and sell so that you are no longer at a loss. That's your break-even quantity. One way of finding it here, you set revenue equal to cost. or profit equal to zero. So when you're finding the break-even quantity, revenue equals cost or profit equals zero. Both ways will get you that quantity. I look at number four, it says a manufacturer sinks his total revenue given by R of X equals 76.5 X and total cost C of X equals 29.70 plus 27 X. Now, in order to solve this, one thing you could do is change these to Y's and solve it. But since they want to find the number of units that gives the break even for the product, break even quantity, you set revenue equal to cost. So you're substituting one into the other. 76.5X equal to 2,970 plus 27x. So if you set them equal to each other, you find your break-even quantity. And then just solve. Subtract the 27x. And you get 49.5 when you do take your exam make sure you show all your work so if you do make a careless mistake I can see that it's a careless mistake and not that you didn't understand the problem when we subtract these we get 49.5 x equal to the 2970 and then we divide to get x by itself And that one works out nice. So he needs to sell 60 sinks in order to break even. Now, if we had a decimal, this is a place where you'd have to round up or you're not going to break even. So if we had the answer 59.0001, we'd still have to round up to 60. Because of this decimal, you're not going to break even. So in this case, no matter what the decimal is, always round up. And you can't sell part of a sink. A place where you wouldn't round up where you'd always round down is cost. If you wanted to know how many you can produce for a certain amount, if you have that decimal, you don't have enough money to finish that one. So no matter what the decimal is, you would drop it off when you're talking about costs. Revenue and profit, in order to hit it, you have to round up. Any questions on that?
A certain product has supply and demand functions. Supply D equals 5Q plus 20 and demand E equals 128 minus 4Q. If the price is $60, how many units Q are supplied and how many are demanded? Okay, so for part A, if the price, so P is 60. Well, if P is 60, then you're plugging it into the equation and finding Q. How many units are supplied and how many are demanded? So for the number supplied, you use the supply equation and 60 was P. And then we just solve. Subtract the 20. And divide by 5. Eight units. So if we sell them for sixty dollars each, the company will supply eight units. The demand. Use the other equation and plug the 60 in. What do we get for Q on the demand? I think 17. Mm -hmm. That's what I got. First, we subtract the 128, get a negative 68, and then divide by the negative 4, get 17. So 17 units are demanded and they'll only supply eight of them when they're sold at $60 each. Any questions on that? What you want to do is try and get at an equilibrium. And that's what part B is asking for. What price gives market equilibrium and how many units are demanded and supplied? When you find your equilibrium, then everything that's produced is sold and um, the customers are happy because they got what they wanted at a price they wanted. And um, the company is happy because they sold everything that they made. Here, we're selling, we're producing enough well, only eight, and our demand is 17, so we have a lot of people who are upset. So by finding the equilibrium, everything that you produce should sell, and everyone who wants one should get one. That would be 5B. To get that e equilibrium, point, you set your supply and demand equal. Since both of them are set equal to P, I can just set we have P equals 5Q plus 20. Okay. 
So I would substitute, I'd substitute this one in for P. Five Q plus 20 equals 128 minus four. Add the four to the other side to combine the Q's. Now, if you can subtract the 20 at the same time, that's fine. Subtract the 20. Is everyone getting 12? So if we supply well either case supply and demand will be the same and it'll be 12 units because this is where they're equal. It's an equilibrium. So 12 units would be supplied and demanded. To find the price, plug it into either one of the two equations. I'm gonna plug it into this one. But you can plug it into the other one and see that our numbers match if you want. Sixty plus twenty So if we sell them for eighty dollars per unit, we want to produce twelve units and we will sell all of them. Any questions on that? So that's called your equilibrium point. You wanna make sure when you're finding the equilibrium point that you find both values, the quantity and the price. The break even, we only look at the, um, the quantity, not the price because the price should be zero or very close to it if we had to round. <clears throat> so equilibrium point, you're finding point. Any questions? Number six. A concert promoter needs to make $84,000 from the sale of 2,400 tickets, and the promoter charges $30 for some tickets and $45 for others. And so we want to find, now they did this in parts on a test, I would, um, probably just tell you to write the two linear equations. I would not give all of these steps, but they're breaking it down for you. There's one on my math lab similar to this. So if there are X of the $30 ticket sold and Y of the $45 ticket sold, Write an equation that states the total number of tickets sold is 2,400. So X is the number of $30 tickets and Y is the number of $40 tickets. If we add them together, 
this many of the one ticket plus this many of the second ticket, it needs to be the 2,400 tickets. So this is actually the number of tickets, the number of $30 tickets and the number of $40 tickets. If we add them together, they should equal the total sold, which is 2,400 tickets. Any questions on that part? Now, B and C is helping you write D. So this is our one equation. B and C are helping you. It says write an expression. So an expression does not have an equal sign in it. An equation has an equal sign. But an expression is not. So X is an expression. This whole thing is an equation. Write an expression that shows the amount of money received from selling X tickets at $30 each. So if we want the dollar amount, we're selling X of them. So we would take 30 times X. So if we sold 10 tickets at $30 each, 10 times 30, we'd make $300. So to find the revenue, it's 30 times X. Oops, I put that with the C. Write an expression that, for part C, write an expression that shows the amount of money received from selling Y tickets at $45 each. So what would be my expression to show the amount that I'll make for the tickets that are $45 each? Anyone? You can type it in the chat. There we go, 45Y, yes. So this is the total amount of money we would bring in from the $30 tickets, and this is what you'd bring in from the $45 tickets. Part D says, write an equation that states the total amount received uh, from the sales, which was 84,000. Well, this is the total from the one. This one's the total from the other price tickets, and they need to equal the total amount we brought in, which was 84,000. So on a test, I would just ask you to write the two linear equations. I would not I would skip B and C. It would just say to write the equations and solve. Is there any questions on getting the equations? <clears throat> I also always recommend um, writing this part. Now on a test, did it say anywhere? Right here. If it already says somewhere, then I would circle that or highlight it. That way, when I get my final answer, I know which one stood for which. So either you want to write it like I did here or circle it if it's already in the problem. That way, then, once we're done, we know what X and Y stand for. Okay, so we have this equation. It says, how many tickets must be sold at each price to yield the $84,000? So we need to take the two equations and solve. Two ways we can do it. One, we could solve this for X and Y and then substitute in, but I want to practice elimination just in case you want to use elimination. So we are going to eliminate. Should we eliminate the X's or the Y's? Anyone? X. Yes. 
Now you could do either one. The reason we're choosing X is because it's a smaller number. So we need to, what should we multiply the bottom row by so that the X's will drop out? Uh, negative 30. Yep. That way then we'll have a negative 30 X and we'll eliminate the X's. Didn't leave enough to go over here. So I'm going to go below. This top one I'm not changing. So it's 30X plus 45Y equals 84,000. And then the bottom I'm multiplying by a negative 30. So I have negative 30X minus 30Y equals a negative Seventy two. Our X's drop out fifteen Y equals twelve thousand. Divide by 15 and get 800. So for Y, we're going to have 800 tickets. Y goes with the $45 tickets. Y goes with the $45 tickets. So 800 tickets. $45 each. But we still need to find X. But is there any questions on that? To find X, you use either one of the equations. Always go back to the original equations. And I'm going to use this one, the X plus Y. Eight hundred is Y, so we just plug that in. Subtract the eight hundred. So we're going to have sixteen hundred tickets. $30 each. Any questions on that? There's probably one like that on the in-class test or number seven. Any questions? Okay, number seven is the same idea. Like you're finding two equations. One of them is the total invested, and one of them is the interest that you make. So a woman invests 52000 in two different mutual funds, one that averages 10% and another that's 14%. If her average annual return of the two mutual funds is 5,720, how much did she invest in each? So X amount, because we want to know how much she invested at each. So X will be in the amount invested at 10%. And Y, the amount, 14%. Always label your variables. So if they're in the equation like the first one was, or last one, you can just circle it. If not, state it so then you remember. <clears throat> Her average annual return for the two funds was 5,720. 5, so we have this and we have this. Oh, 
Both of those will help us make our two equations. The first one is how much she invested. A woman invests $52,000. Well, X the, um, is the amount she put at 10% and Y is the amount she put at 14%. So X plus Y should equal the 52,000. Now, when you're making interest, is there any questions on that part? When you're making interest, your percent gets changed to a decimal, which means you move your decimal to the left two or divide by 100. So this would be 0.1. The amount of interest that we make in this account in one year then is 0.1x. This one's 14%. So the amount we make in interest in this account is 0.14 times y. And the interest we earned was the $5,720. So one of them is your interest, the other one is the amount of money that's in the account. Any questions on that? Um, I'm going to use elimination again because I know here if I multiply by a negative 10, this would be negative 1 and my x's will drop out. So I leave the top x plus y equals 52,000. Then we have um, negative x minus 1.4 y equals a negative. Oh, Any questions? Adding down the X's drop out, we're left with a negative. 0.4y equal to Get it five thousand two hundred. We get 13,000. 13,000 is the amount invested at Y, which was the 14%. To find the amount at 10%, we need to plug this into either one of the equations. Of course, use the first one because there's no decimals. Subtract the 13,000. So we'll invest 39,000 at. Any questions on those? positive. 